So you've explained sort of who was behind some of the planning, but how did sort of the, the actual design and development of Bracknell take place? So the chief architects department and the chief engineers department are responsible for how Bracknell looks, including to the modern day. Um, so between 1949 and 1954, the chief architects department were largely focusing on their master plan. So under the new towns act, they had to create master plans, which would show how they plan to develop a new town. So it says these are the residential areas, these industrial areas, and these are why and how we've decided to plan the new town. Um, so master plans, the colours of them, they have each area has a specific colour. Um, it's following how the ministry liked things to look. Okay. So that you can, if you look at other new towns master plans, you can see some similarities. Um, so they made several master plans, and this took a lot of time. And we, the first master plan, their draft of it was published in 1952. They allowed the public to give some feedback. And the public sometimes were happy, sometimes they weren't. And so they would take the feedback back and then alter their plans or sort of review things and modify it to try and make sure local residents were happy. Um, so when planning an area, they were using such as aerial surveys and ordnance surveys, as well as physically going to a location and looking at it. We have lots of photographs of members of the engineer department going into fields and like digging a hole. So they were deciding where to place the sewers and where uh, the gas pipeline should go through and how to, how to do things. Um, planning was taken incredibly carefully. Um, the engineers and the architects department were located at um, Farley Hall, which is the corporation's head office in Binfield, just outside of Bracknell. They also had corporation offices on Bracknell High Street and up Broadway. Um, and they were really, really paid really good attention to detail. The smallest things, such as road designs, uh, road signage, everything they were interested in, they wanted to pay attention to. Um, so after they submitted their master plans, the government also provides sort of its criticism or its approval about things. Um, so while the first master plan was being developed, it took four to five years, the corporation had actually begun building before they got oh, approval. Wow. Um, and they justified this to government that if they had taken too long, if they had waited five years and not done anything, that local residents would probably be potentially asking questions mm -hmm. and potentially annoyed. Um, so places like Priestwood um, neighbourhood was being developed. So in particular, in December of 1950, the first new houses in Bracknell were started. So these are known as the Alpha One houses. They're down Stony Road in Priestwood. Interestingly, they're designed by the architectural firm Louis de Sossens Aram Partners. So Louis de Sossens was the chief architect and planner of Welland Garden City. And he also plans lots of other housing developments across the United Kingdom. He's a really interesting person. And so those houses down um, Stony Road, um, because the corporation didn't have time to plan itself, they got to Sossens Inn and said, you know, plan these for us. And so what they did was um, they used the plans from Welling Garden City and just okay. brought them to Bracknell. So there are houses in Welling Garden City which are exact copies of the ones in Bracknell. Wow. Or, well, the ones in Bracknell are exact yeah, copy yeah. of the ones in Welling Garden City. And you can really notice these because they're neo-Georgian in design. They have um, bay windows, they're red brick, and um, they're really interesting. So the first residents um, to this part of Stony Road moved in in August of 1951. Um, and this was the new works manager of the first built new factory in Bracknell, which is for Fluey Drive. Um, and in October and later in December of 1951, the other new residents moved into the town. And it's such an exciting event that on the 11th of October 1951, the corporation held like a handover where they gave them the vouchers and they invited the press and they were so happy that the, this first development took place. Um, other developments are called the Alpha 2 and the Alpha 3. They're also in Priestwood. Um, they're called Alpha because it's just, they're just the first development. They're, they're not tests, but they're just their first attempts at development. Mm -hmm. um, and so then they worked on the other neighbourhoods and like Wick Hill and Harmswater, Bullbrook and East Hampstead. And they were, they were very busy. Mm. So was that first master plan approved or did they have to... Edits. So in know? 1952, the, the local residents of Bracknell had some feedback. Um, so some editing was done, some revisions. Mm -hmm. um, and in 1954, they held an exhibition and they showed their first master plan. Okay. Um, 
to local residents. Um, we have multiple copies of the first master plan in our collection. It's really interesting to look at, especially when you consider that the um, fractal designation area was made a lot bigger in 61 and 62, so you can see sort of half of what is now Bracknell is there, but you're, still, you're missing all the, the southern and the western yes, parts. So who were the new people sort of moving into Bracknell New Town, sort of how did that whole process work? So in the early years, people were largely from West London, mm -hmm. because those were the areas of that the Bracknell New Town was specifically built for. So areas like Chiswick, they were trying to get people out to decongest London. Um, so how it would work is you had to have a job in Bracknell um, to be able to move to Bracknell. So for example, um, say you worked in Isleworth and you worked in a factory and then your factory says, oh, we're going to relocate to Bracknell. Um, then, and you're, all your workers want to follow, then they speak to the corporation and the corporation would say, yes, okay, we'll build you houses so that your workers can come and live in Bracknell. Okay. I said a lot of people did move to Bracknell. A lot of people were very happy. Um, they think largely because of um, the way it was designed, the green space, and also apparently the housing managers in particular were very friendly. Um, people were apparently very nice and very helpful. Um, people could also get housing, so if their house or property was purchased by compulsory purchase order, um, then the corporation would uh, give them somewhere to live. Um, because they had demolished the house or moved them out. Um, in later years, there were people from other parts of London, other places in Britain. There were some also private developments, so such as in Wick Hill, which is one of the original neighbourhoods. Um, so there were houses for sale, corporation houses for sale. Um, and also you could buy a plot of land, and if the corporation approved your designs, you could build your own house. People who largely did so were people who had a bit more money or... Um, people who perhaps managers or directors of companies coming to Bracknell. Um, but that's not to say that people who were, who were already in Bracknell didn't buy houses. In the other residential developments of post-1962 when the designated area was extended, um, those new neighbourhoods, a lot of them had areas for private development. Right. So you would have, some of them were bigger, say four or five bedroom houses um, who were living there. So the the target audience um, for the corporation, especially in the early, early period, were people from West London who, as I said, had a job coming to Bracknell, people who lived in London but had an existing job in Bracknell, or it was people who the corporation thought um, were needed in Bracknell. So, for example, police officers, school teachers, post office workers, people who worked for the local gas and electricity boards people who'd be really useful and important for the new town. Um, they also, housing was also for some corporation staff members and also people they thought they would need, such as like builders and painters and decorators. People who, when you're building a new town, you really, really yeah. need those people. Yeah. Um, so those early people sort of coming wholesale with factories, was there any choice in properties or were they literally just told, right, you're number two, you're number three, you're number four on this street? Do you mean no? Well, I, I don't particularly no. Okay. Um, I think during those early days, you know, if you've only built 50 houses, mm. you don't have a lot of choice, no. do you? You're sort of whichever one you may be given. But I think they probably did it from what I understand of, um, so you have three children, you'd need a slightly bigger house and someone okay. will say one child. Um, in some neighbourhoods, such as um, Great Hollands, um, when it was being built, it's very gyroscope limited, um, who had their factories in Bracknell, um, were expanding. And so a lot of people think that Great Hollands neighbourhood was built for very gyroscope. It wasn't. Um, Great Hollands was already planned. The corporation had already had the plans for it um, accepted by the government before very gyroscope um, told them they were going to expand. Um, but once Great Hollands was built, a lot of people there did live um, did, sorry, did work for very Gyroscope, okay. um, partially because of Great Hollands was just below the southern industrial area where Sperry Gyroscope was located. So you would get in neighbourhoods where you would, perhaps you'd walk down the street and there'd be multiple people perhaps you knew, maybe you worked with, as well as people maybe you didn't know.